This week on Wealth Track, the challenging outlook for growth stocks with Margaret Catrano, co portfolio manager of the award winning Clearbridge Large Cap Growth Fund. She is next on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. Welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. The economy and markets are facing multiple headwinds. According to Strategus Research Partners, we are now in the longest and slowest U.S. expansion ever, more than 120 months duration and still going from the economy's 2009 trough. But the cumulative real growth of the economy, that's excluding inflation, is far below other post-World War II recoveries. That growth is now being challenged by trade tensions, particularly with China, political uncertainty here with the impeachment inquiry in next year's election, plus overseas with Brexit, Europe and China's slowdown, Hong Kong's unrest, the alleged Iranian attack on Saudi Arabia's oil fields, and North Korea's missile firing, just to name a few. Are these enough to derail the U.S. economy and the record-breaking bull market in large-cap stocks? In a slow growth world, growth commands a premium. As we have covered extensively on past wealth tracks, growth stocks, particularly the largest U.S. ones known as mega caps, have dominated market revenue and earnings performance over the last decade with a few short live challenges from value stocks in between. Will they continue to do so? This week's guest is a newcomer to wealth track, but not to the investment business. She is Margaret Vitrano co-portfolio manager of the high-performing Clearbridge Large Cap Growth Fund since 2012. The $14.7 billion fund has earned a bronze medalist analyst rating from Morningstar for its well-balanced growth portfolio, which has beaten the vast majority of its large cap peers over the years. The fund was also one of Investor Business Daily's Best Mutual Funds Award winners in 2018 for topping the S&P 500 over the prior three, five, and 10-year periods. Vitrano and her co-portfolio manager, Peter Bourbeau, also oversee Clearbridge's all-cap growth strategies, along with large-cap growth, adding up to nearly $50 billion under management. Clearbridge is a relatively new WealthTrack sponsor, but I've been following the firm's funds for decades. Vitrano is here because of her reputation and performance. I began the interview by asking Vitrano for her view on the health of the U.S. economy. Well, from, from our vantage point, it's not clear yet whether this is a soft patch or the beginning of something worse. I think that clearly the risks in the market are rising. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've looked back at the, the mid-cycle slowdown we had in 2015, and I think there are some good learnings from that. If you look back at that period, um, there were there were two large drawdowns in the equity market during that period. So I think the lesson from that is don't be surprised if volatility continues to be high right. today. Um, and the second learning is that we emerged from that mid-cycle slowdown in 2016, 2017, in large part because of accommodative policy on the part of the Fed and China. So if you ask me what I'm looking for now to decide whether this is the soft patch or the something worse, I would say keep an eye on what the Fed does mm -hmm. uh, in, in the upcoming meetings. Look and see at the impact of the, the cuts the Fed has taken. Right. Um, we're seeing some early signs of, of a beneficiary in the housing market so far, so keep your eye on that. Mm -hmm. um, we need consumer confidence to stay healthy because that's obviously keeping the economy healthy right now. So we need that to stay at a high point. And keep your eye on China. They have implemented more than 100 Easings Easy moves, right? Over the last, I know, it's incredible. Yeah, over the yeah. last 12 to 18 months. So, and are, are we seeing signs of that kicking in yet? It's usually a signs, lag. But it's, it's, yeah, it right. can take a year. A few signs, but we, we need China to improve because we need that for commodity prices. We need that for the industrial part of our economy. So keep your eye on China. I think that's relevant, too. So I, I know that you just mentioned consumer confidence yeah. as well, and I know you also track business confidence. So what are they telling you, and why, why are they so important? Well, consumer, the consumer is 70% is, right, of our economy. The economy. So the consumer is really what's driving GDP growth. Um, and the consumer right now looks good. 
the consumer's employed. <laughs> you know, unemployment that's is huge, so low. Right. That's huge. That's that's the most important thing. Um, and consumer confidence is starting to roll over a little bit, but by and large, quite healthy. Business confidence has taken had taken a, a, a downtick. Mm -hmm. um, you know, part of it is is look at look at the papers, the trade wars, or what you're reading about in the papers, and that obviously is having an impact on businesses and their confidence in the outlook over the next 12 months. Right. Um, their interest in spending and investing in new things. One of our industrials analysts just came back from an industrials conference and he said the mood there is despondent. Really. Uh, people are hesitant about pulling the trigger on a you know a $20 million capital investment. Mm -hmm. So you are seeing that. Um, our hope is that with some of the easings and, and some of those, um, some of the stimulus that we've seen in the US and China, that that will fix itself through time. The trends that you're seeing in the economy, both in the US and the global economy, how much do they impact the large cap growth space? Oh, a, a lot. A lot. Because all of our companies are truly multinational companies. Right. I think the, the average um, in, our, in our universe of holdings, it's about 40% of the revenue from our holdings comes from outside the U.S. So critically wow. important. <laughs> right. Um, and it's, it's not just China. It's also Europe. It's also emerging markets. So diversified in that regard. But it makes a difference. And, and a lot more of a difference than it did in the last economic cycle, what's happening outside of just our borders. To what degree are you getting defensive? And how do you implement that? Well, we, Peter Robo, my partner, and I fundamentally are stock pickers. So mm -hmm. I say we're, we're bottom up stock pickers at heart. Um, we have been thinking more and more about the macro. You have to at this point right. in the cycle. So about a year ago, we started thinking, OK, let's, let's, let's stress test our portfolio for a recession mm -hmm. and let's see what it looks like. Um, and we've taken some of those learnings to try to uh, pivot the portfolio gradually over time to be a little bit more defensive. And that includes things like selling some of our energy positions. Mm -hmm. um, because if we go into a recession, energy is going to have trouble outperforming. Um, it's things like in technology, let's be a little bit underweight technology, as right. we, which we are right now. And let's add some things like, like an Oracle, which mm -hmm. has a high degree of recurring revenue. So that adds some defense even to our technology holdings. So that you know, if the economy slows down, unless a business goes out of business, you're not going to stop paying Oracle. And so, um, so those kinds of shifts have helped us to make the portfolio a little bit more defensive. Right, and so you're, you're stressing a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So these are kind of at the margin changes, but not wholesale. Yeah, and I think it's if we're in that mid-cycle, slow right. down, but then we the, the stimulus again. does pick up, you don't want to be in cash right now. So I think that's the danger of pivoting too much um, to be defensive. Right. I know from my reading that you have three buckets yeah. and uh, of stocks. So the three buckets are select, growth, cyclical, and stable. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, why do you have a three-pronged approach to begin with? What's the rationale behind that? The, the rationale is that we want to perform well through a business cycle. And a business cycle, of course, can have different, different periods when momentum really performs well or when value right. really performs well. Or maybe technology is a leader in the market. And then, then maybe industrials are the leader in the market. We only have 40 to 50 names, so we're concentrated. Mm -hmm. But we want to have lots of different levers within that 40 to 50 so that we can perform well during, mm -hmm. during different kinds of markets. We really do focus most on the, the bottom-up stock selection, trying to find really good businesses. But that framework of the, of the buckets, right. um, it helps us think about, it's not just a question of do you like Disney and do you want to own Disney, but how is it working with everything else that you own? Do you have too much media? Do you have too much exposure to emerging markets? Do you have um, you know, too many companies that could be at risk if we use the internet less? All of those are things that it helps us think through those relationships and make sure that we don't have too much risk in the portfolio. It's really all about risk. And, and how has that kind of diversification among these three different types of stocks worked uh, in, in, in basically decreasing the risk and maybe the volatility of the portfolio? Well, the, if you think about the three buckets, the, the stable bucket right. is, is the biggest bucket. It's the core of the portfolio, 50 to 65 percent of the portfolio, and those are Good growth at a reasonable price kinds of companies, you know, Comcast, United Healthcare, Walt Disney, all really good companies. That whole group tends to do just a little bit better than the market in a low growth environment. So mm -hmm. we'll gain a little bit of ground versus versus indices in that kind of market. And in a down market. In a down market, it performs better because yeah. they're really good quality companies that are holding or gaining market share. They tend to have really good balance sheets, so we, it protects us on the downside. They do a little bit better. Right. So that's the markets. core. How much do you shift the, the from the core 
uh, if if you're in a you know kind of a roaring bull market, do you basically d diminish, you know, reduce the positions in the core and go more to select growth, which I'll go to next, which is kind of the stars, the alphabets, and the we've kept the, Googles the, and the Facebooks pretty stable. Over you time. have they've they've stayed huh. pretty stable. Now, if you asked what's what's the bottleneck in the portfolio, given the move in tech over the last several years and the performance of tech. And bottleneck, how so? What's, what's the limit? Oh, we, I see. We always say we'll be between 50 and 65% and stable, and we've always stayed within that zone. Um, the select bucket, which is the higher growth, right. higher momentum bucket, we limit that to no more than a third of the portfolio. Well, if you looked at tech right now, it's about 50% of the indices. So by definition, it's gonna be harder for us in a real momentum-oriented market because we don't have as much of that higher beta, higher octane um, kind of play in the portfolio. Um, so that, that tends to be the one where over the last couple of years, if you said, what's, what's the single key to a trend that you've been doing? Mm -hmm. We're just constantly trimming out of select because it keeps performing so well and it keeps getting bigger and we wanna manage it down so it's not too big as a percent of the mix in the overall portfolio. So we'll continue to trim down those really great performing tech names that have gotten quite expensive. And that's one way we de-risk. Doesn't it kill you to have to sell these winners? I mean, you know, how hard is it? You're looking at the position and you're saying, whoa, we're, you know, this is really, they're doing so well, they're kind of do starting to dominate the portfolio. I think our secret sauce over the last five years has been risk management. So mm -hmm. it, it doesn't, you know, when, when something's really gone up, I love taking profits, booking your profits and helping protect your money on the downside. In order to, to reduce risk, are you really taking away from the upside performance, which is I think that, I think that's a fair I think that's a fair point, and certainly when you sell something and then it goes up another twenty five percent, that's no fun. Right. Um, but look at fourth quarter two thousand eighteen. Right. Right. I mean, we outperformed by quite a bit in you the did. fourth quarter of two thousand eighteen right. because we were positioned with some defense. So you know, our view is through the business cycle, we want to have good performance. That, that means that you don't outperform every single quarter, unfortunately, but it does mean that you will outperform over a longer period of time through the ups and the downs. The cyclical bucket, and yeah. cyclical I typically think, well, those are stocks that are economically sensitive. Mm -hmm. You mentioned energy a little bit mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. what is, what is, what's in your cyclical bucket? So our definition for cyclical, right. and this helps keep us on point, is that it's companies with revenue or profits that are depressed for reasons we think are fixable. What that means is it can be energy. Mm -hmm. It can be energy, and we could argue that the energy companies have depressed earnings right now, and at $70 um, in, in a, in a barrel oil, in oil, wherever. then these companies are worth a lot more. But it can be Target mm -hmm. a couple of years ago after they had a security breach and people said, no one is going to feel safe shopping at Target anymore. The business is impaired. And we said, no, we think they can work through this. We think earnings over the long period of time can be a lot higher, and the stock can rebound. That's cyclical mm -hmm. to us. And so the interesting thing is it allows us to buy things that are a little bit atypical for a growth portfolio, right. um, but it allows us to find growth in a different way. Target working their way through that and some losing bus money losing businesses in Canada, that's earnings growth. And that's, that's growth and that's diversified growth for us. So, so that's so interesting because you know I wouldn't expect you to have Target in, yeah. a, in a large cap growth portfolio, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There have been a couple instances. American Express, mm -hmm. after they lost a big piece of business from Costco, we bought American Express into the portfolio. It's been a great performer for us. Um, there have been a couple of names like that which have, have enabled us to buy different kinds of companies. Um, importantly, the down capture of that cyclical bucket is quite good. So we were talking about defense. Right. Those companies are really defensive because we tend to be buying them after they've fallen when they have nice cash flow support. Um, and so that, that bucket tends to hold up well in a down market. What would surprise me that's in your portfolio today, for mm. instance, that, that again, wouldn't fit the profile that one typically thinks of as a large cap growth company? Yeah. Um, advanced Auto Parts is mm -hmm. in the portfolio. Not a lot of growth, you might say. Right. Where is the growth there? It's we're, auto parts. Yeah, we're struggling for low single digit mm -hmm. kinds of comps. But when we look at advanced auto parts, it's really a story of um, a, a roll up of several different auto parts retailers. When you look at their profitability versus the peer group's profitability, they're more than a thousand basis points mm -hmm. in margins below um, their peer group in terms of their profitability. And right. so our view is if they can close that gap, maybe improve their margins 300 basis points or so, you can get high teens kinds of earnings growth over the next couple of years. And if the economy slows down, it really shouldn't affect advanced auto parts revenue. So a little bit defensive, but with a lot of earnings growth potential if they're able to improve their profitability.
So everyone's interested in tech, and I know that you know you you hold some of the fangs. Sure. So. You were a tech analyst by training, mm -hmm. and so one of the things that you've been doing is you've been assessing the what the risk portfolio, the vulnerability of the of the of tech stocks yeah. uh, to an economic downturn. Is mm -hmm. that basically what you've been doing, mm -hmm. or to regulation or whatever? You know, it, looking at the portfolio on those top names, yeah. uh, you're overweighting Facebook. We are. Why? <laughs> um, the, we are overweight Facebook. I would say the way we think about the FANG stocks is collectively mm -hmm. first. Oh, you um, do? We do think about them collectively because they're so big in the benchmark. Right. They're 25% or so of the benchmark. You know, we can't spend 30% of our portfolio on five stocks, and we don't want to. We want to be more diversified than that. So the way we've thought about those big FANG stocks is let's find the one we like the best and go overweight that and then, then we'll be underweight some others. Um, I think it's really important right now to understand the regulatory risk mm -hmm. with those companies. Um, and and it, from our view, Facebook, I think has a little bit less regulatory risk over the next 12 to 18 months versus some of the other companies. Facebook, I mean, they're under a lot of regulatory scrutiny and you know, both in Europe and here and other parts of the world. So why is, why less? Why do they have less scrutiny than others, other things? The core business fundamentals are really good uh -huh. in Facebook. And I think from our U.S.-based perspective, we think, oh, this is mature. It's not growing as fast as it used to. It's actually still growing quite rapidly outside of the U.S. That is where most of the revenue growth is going to come from over the next several years. And GDPR has already been implemented. Mm -hmm. so, um, so we've already worked our way through that potential headwind. Um, I think the company has taken a lot of steps to improve, the, to improve customer privacy, uh -huh. to have better oversight of their, um, of their content. They're working their way through it. They're not done, but I think the core business fundamentals are, are quite good. Other things in the portfolio, Amazon. What's mm -hmm. your view of Amazon? We like Amazon. We think they have a, a great first mover advantage in their marketplace business, and that has legs for the next several years. And their Amazon Web Services, the outsourced data center right. business, is highly profitable and has a lot of growth runway ahead. So, um, so we still feel really good about Amazon as a core holding. One of your, your co-portfolio manager was a healthcare analyst at one point. So, you know, how, where does healthcare fit in as far as growth? I mean, you talk about problematical mm -hmm. industries mm -hmm. and certainly no idea what's going to happen with the 2020 presidential election. That's right. So how does healthcare figure into a growth portfolio? I tell you, if there's one thing we learned after 2016, it's that sometimes perceived risk can be every bit as important as actual risk. Right. And what I mean by that is when the presidential candidates started talking about drug pricing as a topic, in 2016, we sat down with our healthcare analyst and we said, is this a real risk? We, we thought we had the risk understood in terms of how, how the probability of it being implemented. Widespread healthcare reform has not been implemented in the US over the last several years. And yet, the biotech companies have, has, have underperformed massively. Right. Um, and so the, the point with that is, I still think that healthcare is, um, is, is a key topic on both sides of the aisle. I still think that it's something that is going to have a headwind for at least at least until we know who our next president mm -hmm. is. Um, and then we'll see. So we've trimmed some of our biotech holdings. Um, we, we were at one point overweight biotech and now we're a little bit underweight. Biotech. And of course they were great performers for, great uh, until performers. they weren't. Yes, they right. were great performers. I think now it's really hard to tell what the catalyst is gonna be that's gonna help those companies outperform. Give us an example of, of what in your core portfolio, what company kind of exemplifies what you put in your core stable portfolio or bucket? Disney. Well, Disney. Disney is in the portfolio. Um, has been for, for years, mm -hmm. um, but we still really like the business. I think you could almost look at Disney as, as two pieces. Right now, the core business is, is steady. The broadcast networks, cable networks, theme parks, consumer products, it's a steady business. Um, they, they've shown over time that they are good at spending money on content and generating good returns from it. So I think that part of the business is fine. Um, but I think importantly right now, you're not paying a lot for the option mm -hmm. of them being successful in that direct to consumer business. So we think the valuation is still interesting because we think if anyone is going to be able to succeed in pivoting to a direct to consumer over the top relationship, it's gonna be Disney with the amount of content, the depth and breadth 
of content that they have. And one of the interesting things you said that uh, that you've owned Disney for a long time, mm -hmm. and I know your turnover is 20%, which mm -hmm. means that you know on average you can hold companies for five years mm -hmm. or more. Mm -hmm. Why is your turnover so low, considering that your peers, I think it's like 73% or higher, yeah. and in other large cap growth funds? We believe that if you find good business models, you can let them compound mm -hmm. over time. And I would argue that the market is quite efficient in the short term. The market is not as efficient longer term. So if you're willing to look oh, out. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. If you're willing to look out a year or two, right. you can say, what do I think the chances are that Disney's going to be successful in their over-the-top strategy? And let's just pretend they are really successful, and let's give it a Netflix kind of multiple. Then what is it worth? Mm -hmm. And then let's discount that back and see what would I pay for it today. That's when you can find really fun inefficiencies in the market is when you're able to look out a little bit further, I think that's where the market has the inefficiencies. It's the time value. You know, there's a tremendous amount of competition in the large cap space mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly now large cap growth because it's, it's been such a huge mover. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people own some of the large cap, the FANGs, for instance, mm -hmm. in index funds. Mm -hmm. And we've just had a situation uh, recently where for the first time ever, the assets in passive equity funds have surpassed those mm -hmm. in actively managed mm -hmm. funds. Mm -hmm. Looking at your performance, you have outperformed the S&P 500 for multiple year periods, yep. but you've underperformed the benchmark, which some, you know, Morningstar gives you the Russell 1000 mm -hmm. uh, growth benchmark by a tiny percentage, but nonetheless, you've lagged a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what's the advantage of going with you as an active manager versus, let's say, the Russell 1000 growth index? Mm -hmm. I think it's risk management. Mm -hmm. I would point you back to fourth quarter of 2018. Um, you know, I think that active managers, I'm biased, of course, but no. I think that active managers are going to fare better in a down market. And well, certain active managers, quite honestly, that, right, the, Majority of them have not, but yeah, I yeah, mean, I, you have. If you, if you look at the the composition of the indices, right, the way they're, the way they are created, the best performing stocks of last year, get increased in the benchmark. Yes, that means you buy stocks high, <laughs> right, and hopefully sell them higher. We'd rather buy stocks low, mm -hmm. and and let them accrue. Um, passive, I, I appreciate the, the 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 goal of trying to save money right. by buying indices, but there can be some risk in the concentration of that benchmark. To own 25% of your holdings in a few names, or own you know it's been as high as 10% in single names over time. Right. There's some risk in in having an in index that's that concentrated without having some oversight. Let me ask you about a, a one investment. You have young children, they are, you yeah. have put their college funds in your fund, as mm -hmm. a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if there's one investment that we should all own some of in a long-term diversified portfolio, what would it be? It would be Visa. Visa, I really? Think Visa is a really interesting long-term compounder. Mm -hmm. um, you may use your credit card all the time, and it may surprise you that outside of the US, in countries like Germany, and Japan, 15 to 20% of purchases are done with plastic. The rest is still cash. Real? It's no, that's not, it's not just astonishing. Visa, Visa and MasterCard both have um, large barriers to entry because they've been they, they, they've spent the last 50 years creating these networks. Um, they're highly profitable businesses, and I think you can easily see line of sight to to double digit earnings growth. It's a good compounder. Great. So, Margaret Vitrano, thank you so much for joining us for the first time on Wealth Track. We thank really you. appreciate it. At the close of every Wealth Track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is own some dividend growth companies. We just discussed companies with sales and earnings growth, but the appeal of increasing dividend payments is strong as well. Companies with histories of increasing dividends over the years are usually financially healthy, more defensive in nature, and can provide reliable income and compounding power if the dividends are reinvested. One of our most popular guests over the years has been Hirsch Cohen, a colleague of Vitrano's who helps oversee Clearbridge's dividend strategies. Once again, he has shared his list of dividend compounders, companies with great balance sheets and a history of growing dividends. We will have it on our website. In addition, Vanguard recently reopened its actively managed Vanguard Dividend Growth Fund to new investors. A longtime Morningstar favorite rated five-star gold and has had the same manager since 2006 
and has beaten the market with lower volatility over the years. Now, for investors who prefer passive alternatives, Vanguard also has the gold-rated Vanguard Dividend Appreciation ETF, symbol VIG. Now, interestingly, the actively managed fund has outperformed the ETF because it's been able to take advantage of situations the index fund could not. Dividends are always attractive, but they are especially welcome in times like now when income is scarce and markets are volatile. Next week, our focus is on China. First Eagles, Idana Apio and Matthews Asia Tiffany Shao address the opportunities and risks of investing there. In this week's extra feature on WealthTrack.com, Margaret Vitrano discusses her mentoring program to recruit more women into the investment business. In the meantime, we want to continue to recruit you to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Thank you for watching. Enjoy your Columbus Day holiday and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one.